Good afternoon and welcome to this Chemistry World webinar. This month we are celebrating Black History Month and we have three fantastic guests joining us to explore all different aspects of black history in chemistry and indeed the challenges that black chemists still face today. Joining me on screen right now is Rachel Dance. She is our BSL interpreter. If you are making use of Rachel's services there, you know that GoToWebinar allows you to move the cameras around, move the webcams around. So put her exactly where you need her on screen in order to make the best use of her. We're delighted that she has joined us from Cambridge Deaf Association to help with the transliteration of these webinar series. So today we are using GoToWebinar as our webinar platform. And one of the key things about this, as well as allowing you to move the webcams around, is that it allows you to ask questions of our speakers at any point throughout the event. So the box down at the bottom there, you can use to ask questions. That might be about the platform itself. How do I get the recording? Will I get a certificate? And yes, you will. Everybody who attends live gets sent a certificate to say thank you. Um, or it might be a question specifically for one of our speakers. We do have Q&A time at the end of today's webinar. So any question that occurs to you at any point point throughout, just get it into that box down at the bottom of your GoToWebinar panel, which usually launches itself on the right hand side of the screen. And we will make sure we put those to our guests as we go through. Now, today we are celebrating Black History Month. We're recognising and celebrating black individuals and their contributions to chemistry. We will also showcase the importance of continuing to build on these achievements while recognising that firm action is needed to eradicate the barriers of racism and discrimination in chemistry. So hopefully over the course of the next hour, we will you will join us in celebrating the black community, particularly those in the chemical sciences. We'll explore the actions needed from individuals, organisations and institutions to increase black representation and to break down barriers for black people in the chemical sciences. And we will learn how to ensure how ensuring a more inclusive community for black chemists is in fact better for all of us. Three excellent guests today. Uh, first up, we will have Karen Salt, who's an expert on governance, race, institutional transformation and justice, followed by Robert Makaya, who is vice chancellor, sorry, pro vice chancellor for global engagement and chemistry professor at the University of Nottingham. And then third, but not least, uh, we have Lara Lalemi, who is a chemistry PhD student at Bristol University, and she is a champion in decolonizing science. So we'll go into what decolonizing science is and how we can all play our role in that. Uh, a little bit later on in the presentation. So first of all, I'm going to hand over to Karen Saltz. There's no presentation and no camera for Karen, so sit back and enjoy what Karen has to say. She has over 26 years of experience working in and with communities, organizations, charities, and governmental bodies, including running nonprofits and engaging in community development work. She's an expert on sovereignty, power, collective activism, and systems of governance. She's led and collaborated on a number of research projects, many of which explore participatory democracy trust and collective governance. She's a former member of the Arts and Humanities Research Council Advisory Board. She's a long-term reviewer and assessor of research projects and a collaborator with institutions, community groups, governmental bodies and civic sector agencies. She continues to contribute today to UK and international conversations about research policy, transformational social justice and institutional change. And we are delighted to have her. It's really quite an honour to have her with us today. So, Karen, thank you for joining us. And uh, I think I should really just step back and let you take the limelight. Oh, thank you so much. And um, and thank you to everyone who's found time in their in their day um, uh, with with so much going on, I think, globally around the world and, and, and individuals, um, your individual personal lives uh, to to join me and this excellent um, uh, group of panelists um, today for the for 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 what I often refer to as um, not necessarily Black History Month, but 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 really the everyday practices of celebrating and recognizing the contributions of Black people. Um, and that's not to say that we're not interested in all people, um, or to say that we're not interested in the complexities with which those who are part of the African diaspora give us uh, different languages, different religions, different backgrounds. Um, different ethnicities. Uh, it's just a wealth of, of beauty and 
vibrancy and joy and and um, and creativity. Um, and so, you know, part of what I want to start off with 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 my contribution is to really think about you know how do we make sure that the energy and the enthusiasm um and the and the amazing amount of recognition that many give during october within the uk and black history month how do we make sure that that same sort of concentration vitality recognition um and 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 i and i think just um you know this collaborative spirit maintains itself all year round every day with every single thing that people might do um, and how they build and how they create networks and how they, um, how they sit and do their work. Um, because there's, there's something, you know, I, there, there are some who lament that Black History Month becomes uh, a, an, a, a singular moment on a calendar where organizations and institutions and individuals start to recognize and kind of think about the contribute, contributions of individuals who identify as black um and uh and you know to be fair there is probably a bit of validity to that criticism in the sense of um just the just the amount of interest uh, and um and, and the amount of things that happen but if you also look at this as here is this month where people can rededicate themselves, where a whole set of people who might just spend all of their time just in the trenches getting the work done, um, and they can actually just lift their head up and look around and go, look at the amazing contributions from so many people, and they can they can remind themselves once again that they're not doing this alone, um, and that they're they're not by themselves as the only black scientist or the only black researcher or, or the only only person who identifies as black. Who, who is just driven and dedicated to discovery, to the magic of actually um, uh, of creating and making and, and doing and being in the world. Um, so that's my challenge to all of you who are listening, is to, is to take from the, the, the conversations and the, um, uh, the messaging from today uh, into, into your everyday, um, so that you, you, you actually use this as a moment to reaffirm that commitment um, to, to what the energy uh, and the enthusiasm of Black History Month can give all the time um, and not necessarily just what, what can transpire in the month of October. Um, but for me, one of the things about, about Black History Month that is really uh, quite powerful, and, I, and so here's a bit of full disclosure. Um, uh, I, I, there was a gracious and, and fantastic introduction to me and, and, um, and, and a bit of what I'm doing, um, which, is, which is really welcomed, and, and I thank you for that. Um, but I'm not a chemist. Um, I am a person, though, who has loved chemistry um, and, who, and who thinks in a lot of the ways that um, those who are involved in various, various forms of, uh, of, of work within chemistry um, actually do. So I'm, I'm a patterns person. Um, uh, I loved all of my work in chemistry. I loved taking physics. Um, I loved working in, um, in, in various complex systems. And so for me, the complexity of the system was, was really often what, what galvanized me, whether or not it's thinking about chemical re reactions or, or thinking about things like optics um, uh, or, 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 or string theory. Um, and I take that same interest and that same desire and enthusiasm of thinking about systems and patterns um, and, and those sets of complexity. I've, I've often said it, I feel like it's my, my bit of my superpower in terms of being able to reflect on that. Um, and I've taken that into a lot of the work that I do um, uh, with communities or, or across institutions um, or with various other kind of collectives. And, um, and it's meant that I've had really fantastic long-term uh, relationship with the Royal Society of Chemistry, um, who I thank for, for setting this up. Um, and it's also meant that I've been able to work really quite closely with a whole range of different uh, sciences um, on, on a number of different types of projects uh, of, of discovery, um, sometimes that are um, uh, based around uh, kind of lab-based work, uh, work and, and others that are um, more outward-facing in the community and, and maybe more applied um, in their mechanisms. So I've been a very fortunate researcher um, to work in really interdisciplinary teams to to lead them um, to be well funded and um, and to and to really think really quite critically about um, knowledge and discovery and sharing 
those discoveries with a whole range of other people because I, I really strongly believe that everybody is a knowledge bearer um, and, and, and important ways. Um, but I've had the real big privilege in the work that I've done um, to be able to sit alongside and walk with various communities and really learn from other sets of lessons and, and strategies, especially strategies of survival. And these are really quite important for me as I think about being um, a black female academic or a black female researcher, um, or, or if I start to think about um, even the, 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 the roles that I have in, in terms of uh, interfacing with other governments, um, I can walk into a number of spaces uh, that could be in central London, that could, that could essentially be in Brussels, and, and, and rarely encounter uh, another person who ha you know, carries the set of characteristics that I do. Um, and, and I reflect on that quite a lot in those settings and think about how do I increase representation uh, from the, the, just the wealth of brilliant people that exist a around the world um, in a number of these spaces. But it also helps me to reflect on and think about the ways that people have contributed in lots of other ways. So I've, I had a, a fabulous research project that I was involved in as a collaborator called Common Cause Research. And, um, and what was really important about this project was that it was really interested in understanding um, what are the ways and kind of patterns that have brought um, various black and minority ethnic communities uh, to work on research with researchers. Um, and, and, and really what's the, the sort of um, you know, uh, the lines that have actually sometimes divided those groups and then the ones that blurred those where people all imagine themselves as being researchers um, moving forward and working together. And one of the things we learned quite immensely from, from looking at these, these partnerships that have occurred and the, and the types of relationships that people have built is how much the value of the contribution of different sets of folks um, and how much the recognition and how much these issues of power can kind of play out in those scenarios and in those sets of interactions. And I know some of our panelists are going to talk a little bit about these sets of things, these, these, these ideas of these partnerships and these relationships um, and how to try to dismantle um, some of the sets of hierarchies that exist within them. Um, and that research really highlighted that the, the, the partnerships that work well are the ones that confront these. Not they, they didn't just try to wish them away, they actually sat down and really tried to work on them um, and reflect on them and really critically evaluate what people bring to the table, the presumptions they have in their sets of interactions and how the sets of systems that they put in place maybe even perpetuate certain sets of problems. Um, but I've also been able to be involved in projects. Uh, one that uh, was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council as part of um, the recognition of the UN International Decade for People of African Descent. It's a fabulous highlight call um, with a whole range of networks. And, and I was involved in a project called Geographies of Black Protest. Um, and one of the things that was really important about this project was to really learn the lessons from all sets of different sets of protests, from people putting food on, the, uh, on their table, all the way through to people engaged in research and, and actually engaged in science as a formal protest because they were in environments or places where people who looked like them weren't supposed to do that work, um, or they were denied access to certain sets of places, or they were denying, or they were demanding, I should say, um, greater uh, recognition of their labor and their roles that they were involved in. So we traveled around the world to different locations, including in the UK, really trying to learn from these various different past moments and, and understanding these strategies of survival. Um, and if there's one thing that is powerful to me about Black History Month, are the strategies of survival and really starting to communicate. Yes, we can talk about obviously racism and discrimination and various forms of, of, of injustices that exist, but we can also talk about the amazing communities that have remained and, and, and transformed themselves and demanded more change and have worked together um, and have aligned themselves in ways that are really quite powerful. And, and I don't know if the Royal Society of Chemistry will talk about some of the work it's been doing um, around uh, bringing people together in various different communities around the world around chemistry but it's that set of kind of 
strategies of survival, really thinking about capabilities and capacities across the pace, uh, across the uh, multiple spaces. That for me really signals to, to me for, for Black History Month, the lessons we can learn. What are the ways and the tools and the different sets of strategies, not just the laws and the bills and the papers and the grants and the projects, but the various, the day-to-day -day strategies that different groups have been involved in. What are the mechanisms that they put in place to they try to engage and have these sets of interactions. And I'm hopeful um, over the course of the rest of the panel, as my other panelists talk about the different ways that they've worked with others and the different sets of ways that they've been thinking about chemistry and the system and, and dismantling it and, and rebuilding it in a more equitable, equitable way, that we actually start to see the ways that we can both confront and we can challenge, but we really can spend quite a bit of time practicing the types of changes that we're talking about, that we can turn these into everyday mechanisms for ourselves um, at, so that they can, they can transform how we greet people, they can transform how we sit down at the table with people, and they can transform the ways that we, um, that we nurture and support each other. Um, because this is often quite hard work to, to, to do, um, and, it's, and it's work that, that it should be work that everybody is committing to, um, and not just one particular set of people in terms of creating that kind of just and equitable world kind of moving forward. Um, and so I think I'm going to stop there um, and, and, and turn the, 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 the panel over to my panelists now. Um, and hopefully you've started to queue up some questions um, as you're starting to think about your own life and your own kind of work and the environments that you're working in, whether or not you're a chemist or you're a chemistry aligned um, or you're an industrial partner working in different ways. Um, and we can continue this conversation moving forward. Thank you very, very much, Karen. That was a, a wonderful introduction to this topic. And uh, we, we have two more speakers who are going to take it a bit further and explore some other aspects. Uh, Karen did mention some of the work, the, the good work, as I'm bound to say, that the Royal Society of Chemistry is doing. We've got some links and further resources that we will show you uh, after the other presentations from the other speakers. So do hang around to see those. There's some uh, various different things you can get involved in, you can learn from, and you can take part in. Uh, but I will hand now to our second speaker, Robert Makaya, who received a B BSc in chemistry from the University of Nairobi and then went on to get a PhD from the University of Cambridge. Uh, he then did a research fellowship at Trinity College, was awarded an EPSRC advanced fellowship, then been appointed to a lectureship in materials chemistry at the University of Nottingham, was now professor of materials chemistry and pro vice chancellor of global engagement. So clearly he has walked through the research uh, pathway that so many other people work, but in many ways people like him hadn't trod that pathway before. So it's wonderful to have him with us. He's now also, I should add, a Royal Society Wolfson Research Merit Award holder uh, from 2017 to 2022. Robert, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a delight to have you with us. And again, I will hand over and uh, let you deliver your presentation. Thank you again. Uh, thank you, thank you very, thank you very much, Ben. And um, uh, like Karen, I'd like to uh, thank you all for taking the time to uh, to be here. Uh, I guess the one thing that holds us all together, uh, or the interest that um, uh, brings us here, is uh, perhaps an interest that we have in uh, in chemistry. Uh, and whatever contribution you're making uh, uh, to sort of the uh, chemistry scene, um, I, I just want to suggest to you that. Um, uh, a more diverse uh, group is uh, a much better performing uh, group than one that is uh, not so diverse. Uh, and any scenario that um, ex excludes a significant proportion of those who would be uh, participating uh, actually is not uh, achieving its uh, its full potential. Uh, so what I'm going to do uh, is um, uh, I'm, I'm just first of all let me let me thank the um, uh, colleagues of the Royal Society of Chemistry, particularly the inclusion and diversity team, who have very much uh, assisted uh, in getting my presentation and uh, together, uh, and of course the team at Chemistry World as well. Uh, so um, I'm just going to uh, set some context in terms of what I want to explore over the next few minutes, uh, and um, uh, give you an idea of why, in the context of what we are talking about today, you might be interested in my uh, in in my story, uh, and um, uh, in my. Uh, role, uh, my, my main role at the University of Nottingham uh, right now 
Uh, I am a university leader, and so I'll say a little bit about uh, the role of uh, higher education institutions and, uh, and how you uh, can make a, a positive difference to what we are talking about uh, today. Uh, and so I'd just like to, um, first of all, start by setting uh, the context. Uh, and I think the context is actually very, very important. Uh, so what I'm presenting here is um, uh, ethnicity data uh, for chemistry students um, uh, and the progression uh, from uh, undergraduate students to professors in UK universities. So uh, this data has been um, has been taken from uh, HISA, uh, HISA data, where HISA is the Higher Education Statistics Agency, uh, and it's a couple of years old. It's um, uh, for the year 1718, um, and uh, you will be able to inter interrogate this data uh, a little bit more uh, along with an article that was uh, written uh, in, in Chemistry World a few, uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, and so what this data shows uh, really, and uh, I mean, I don't have enough time to go into the, into the details, uh, but, but it, it just shows that um, if, you, if you look at undergraduates, uh, students who are doing chemistry in the UK, uh, and uh, if you sort of add um, those that are from those, what are generally referred to as uh, BAME communities, uh, then you find that actually the proportion is uh, is slightly higher than their representation in uh, in the general population, which means that actually uh, from secondary school um, uh, young people are sufficiently enthused to want to do a chemistry degree. Uh, but then there is a there is a, a, a huge drop from uh, undergraduate students to PhD students. Um, uh, and um, if you look specifically at what happens to um, uh, black PhD students as they progress, then the number for members of staff um, uh, continues to decrease for non-professorial staff uh, and, and, and for professors, it's really a, a, barren, uh, a barren ground. Um, so a little bit more, uh, more context on this, uh, this, this data here. And this is often referred to as the leaky pipeline. Actually, I would, I'd actually refer to it as a broken pipeline. It's not leaking, it's, it's basically broken. Uh, and, and there's a point where very little is actually going through. Um, and, and so here, this uh, uh, again, it's good to think about the intersectionality and uh, some of the, um, uh, the other issues that uh, come into play. And this is the, uh, this is the breakdown of uh, UK uh, um, uh, undergraduate students um, according to their uh, gender. So again, you can see here the fe male-female uh, split uh, if you consider black students in particular, there are more uh, female black students doing uh, a chemistry uh, degree than, than, than male, male students, um, which is uh, somewhat flipped in some of the, um, uh, the other uh, groupings. Uh, and then if you then look at the type of institution that the uh, students go to, uh, again, you see here, um, again, going rather quickly, that uh, the proportion of uh, black students in particular are actually more generally ethnic minority students in Russell Group uh, universities is uh, a lot lower than in sort of non-Russell Group universities and the post-92 universities. Um, and, and, and you can interpret this data uh, in, in many different ways. Uh, but I think there is, the, the, there is a start there of a suggestion uh, that um, uh, the, this sort of splitting is already giving an in, it's some information about the, the extent to which that progression will occur. Uh, right through to the more senior uh, levels. Uh, so the, 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 the final slide that I'm going to show here really is a, is a comparison uh, bet between uh, three subjects, that's biology, chemistry, and physics. Um, both um, physics and biology also show a drop in the uh, number of, uh, uh, of, of students that actually progress all the way to, uh, to professor. Uh, but as you can see here, for physics and chemistry, here's the data for 2017-18 actually shows that the number of professors is, is zero. Uh, and of course, I have to say here that, uh, uh, of course, I exist and I, I have been a professor for uh, the last 12 years. Uh, but of course, this is rounded up to the nearest five. Uh, and so if it is uh, less than two or three, then it is rounded down uh, uh, to, to zero. So this is the context here, and, uh, and, and data doesn't really lie. That's the data that we have got. Um, and, 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 and the question that one has to ask is, why is that so? Um, is, is chemistry uh, a meritocracy? Uh, is, does chemistry actually see race? 
Uh, some might actually say that why are we even talking about this? Because chemistry is it doesn't say color, it doesn't say race at all. Uh, it's just a meritocracy. But actually, the data doesn't back that up. There is something that is actually um, wrong with uh, a system where a, a particular group of, uh, of section of the community is not able to progress in the way that other sections are able to uh, progress. So I would challenge the idea that, that chemistry is a, is, is a meritocracy. The other thing, of course, is to recognize that um, uh, chemistry, uh, the chemistry community does not exist in a utopia. It actually exists in the community that, uh, that we all live in. And actually some of the issues that are uh, taking place there uh, and some of the, the barriers that we see to progression of certain groups uh, also do uh, or can exist in, uh, in chemistry in the way that the data has just shown. Uh, now, why might you be interested in my story? This is not an opportunity for me to talk about myself. Uh, but obviously, I have shown you the data, but I am sitting here as a, as a professor of chemistry and, and, and also a pro vice chancellor in, um, in a university in the UK. Uh, so how has that happened? Uh, I think all I'm going to say is that um, uh, I, I recognize that in my journey, um, I have had people who have really uh, supported me, people who have taken interest in, in, in my career. Uh, and and have assisted me in get moving moving along. I'm not going to name anybody, but uh, but all along I have had whether you want to call them allies or whether you want to call them uh, sponsors or whether you want to call them mentors. I've had people who have taken an interest, but that is not to say that it is that interest that actually has made it possible for somebody uh, like me to, to 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 progress in the way that I have. Uh, I, I, I have to say that that ability to progress that way exists in a large number of other people. It is not, it's not special to any one of us, at uh, least uh, to me in particular. But actually having those, um, those allies and sponsors and mentors, all of them who have been white, I should say, because there was, there was not a senior uh, black person that I would look at as a role model. Um, that has been very, very important in the, in, the, in, in, in the progress of my career. And that is where I start to challenge those who are uh, in this webinar to think about what they can do to contribute positively um, in um, enabling uh, everybody to be able to uh, progress, particularly uh, those who don't seem to be progressing, in this case, uh, uh, black students all the way from undergraduate to, uh, to PhD and beyond. Um, I would also just like to comment about the role of higher education institutions, um, and, um, and, and, and particularly in, in, in the sense that I am uh, now myself a, a, a leader. And, and I'd just like to say that I, um, uh, my, my view is that the actual environment that exists in higher education institutions and, um, uh, and, and, and the experience of black students is very, very important. And, and more and more uh, UK higher education institutions are becoming very sensitive uh, about uh, the experience of, uh, of, of black students. I know we are doing that in, in, in Nottingham. Uh, if only to make, it, um, uh, to, to make it a positive experience for them, uh, I think, of course, there is the issue of role models. There are not many role models. If you don't see somebody like yourself ahead of you, uh, that can actually put doubt in your mind about whether you should be in, in, in that position. And that is something that I know that um, higher education institutions are very much uh, trying to uh, address in, 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 at the moment to improve the environment, to, to, to make sure that the ex experience is positive, and also to, to have role models. Of course, it's going to take time for that to happen, but it's absolutely uh, something uh, that, uh, that, that, that needs to be done. Um, now, what can the Royal Society of Chemistry do? I think webinars like this one here are very, very important uh, in actually shining a light on, uh, on an issue that has been with us for a very long time. Um, and I myself have started working very closely with the Royal Society of Chemistry, and I think, we absolutely have to look at the data, we have to collect the data, we have to analyze the data, we have to monitor the data, and we have to see and try and see the data improving in the right direction. And I think that is where uh, uh, Royal Society of Chemistry and other learned societies um, in other areas can um, uh, play a very big role. Uh, and finally, um, what have I got to say to you in terms of what you can do? Um, I think, uh, the, the, the change actually has to start with us. We as a community, uh, we have to recognize that uh, we are missing out on a lot of talent uh, that would actually be improving the environment um, that we work in, uh, that we each one, regardless of where we are, regardless of what our role is, 
this can actually recognize that there is an issue here. We may have different views, uh, but actually, as I've already said, the data doesn't lie. Uh, and 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 to 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 then be supportive, um, and to to then want to be part of the solution uh, than part of the problem. But I hope that discussions like the one we are going to have today, perhaps when it comes to uh, question and answer session and some of the other issues that are uh, are going to be um, raised as we we go along, will will start to um, show what we uh, can do. To address this, uh, uh, this 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 particular issue, the the the, the least option uh, or the last thing that we must not or we must not do is to do nothing. Because the best way of making sure that nothing happens is to do something. We have to do something, and it has to be uh, in a concerted and in a positive way. And I think I'm going to stop there uh, for now. Perhaps I'll say more we, when we come to the question and answer session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. That was a fantastic overview. Some really good points there to, to take forward as well. In particular, this idea that you can't be what you can't see. And I'm sure that that does put uh, undue pressure on people like yourselves who are relative trailblazers, who you may be a very introverted person and not want to, uh, to have to put yourself out there. But in order for people to see what what they can be, then uh, we do need to shine a light on examples like your own. So thank you very much and do stick around for the Q&A uh, session uh, coming up as well. I can see we've already had a few good questions for you as well. A little reminder to uh, everybody in the audience, the sort of chat or questions box at the bottom of GoToWebinar, that's how you get your questions in. But you may also see in that chat box that that's where we're sharing some links to resources. So you can see the data analysis, uh, the RSC data analysis report that we've just shared there, and also the Chemistry World article that put that in some context. Uh, so keep an eye on that for resources that you can click through uh, and things that you can read as well. So we're moving on to our third uh, final, but by no means least guest of today. Laura Lalemi is a third year chemistry PhD student. Uh, she lives, in, well, she's from London, but lives in Bristol. She has experience organizing conferences around inequality and lack of representation in higher education. So she's exactly the right sort of person to speak to today. Currently studies at the University of Bristol in aerosol science, examining climate relevant compounds and photochemistry. Uh, she's always had a passion for, for change and being a STEM subject, she could see the development that was needed to ensure that those from underrepresented groups are better seen and better heard. And as we've seen from that data, that's definitely an issue. We are going to ask a poll now ahead of Lara's talk, uh, which uh, not only gives you an opportunity to interact, uh, but also gives Rachel just a brief moment to relax her arms. As you can see, she's been doing non-stop translation. Uh, so I'm going to ask this poll now. So one of the things Lara is going to be talking to us about is about decolonizing science. So the question you will see on your screen soon simply uh, helps us to gauge your confidence and your level of understanding about what decolonizing science actually is. So that poll will be on screen shortly and then we will come back to you with the results uh, in about a minute or two's time. And we're back. Thank you very much for uh, for sharing your thoughts there. Uh, I'm just going to quickly share the results in just a second, but I can tell you that of the people who voted, uh, it looks like very few of you uh, said you were genuinely confident. Only about 10% were willing to tick that box. And then we got a fairly even split for everyone else saying you're either little confident or not very confident. So Lara, I think, has a, a mountain to climb here in making sure that people understand uh, not only what decolonizing science really means, but what its implications really are. So let's just show those results. And again, uh, Rachel and I will go quiet just for a second. So there we go. Thank you very much for that. So next thing to do is to hand over to Lara. Lara, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's wonderful mm -hmm. to have you with us. It's really nice to take a slightly different perspective on this as well. And mm -hmm. hopefully we'll see your screen in just a second. We're not, there we go. That is that is a very untidy desktop there. It makes me very anxious. I know, I know, I know, I know. don't worry. <laughs> I'll get to that at some point. <laughs> Okay, well, once again, thank you for joining us. I will step back and let you, uh, let you get on with your presentation.
Thank you very much. Um, thank you to the RFC for inviting me for today. Um, it's an honour to speak, um, especially in Black History Month, but um, hopefully not always pertaining to Black History Month. Uh, my name is Lara Lanami, um, Mosul Mala Lanami. I am um, a university student from Bristol, as you heard, um, and a lot of my work kind of started um, in Bristol because of the support networks that I kind of had here. And I'll just tell you a little bit about how I got into it. So um, I worked in undergraduate labs um, and I was teaching young um, young people coming into chemistry um, about labs and um, how they work. And I was asking one of the lab demonstrators, um, the leads, um, like, can we do something around decolonizing science? I've read about it. I feel like there's something that needs to be done, um, but I didn't really know how. And through um, a lot of hard work, we started um, a decolonizing science workshop, which we delivered to universities across the UK um, that kind of tackles this issue. But I'm kind of going to give you um, a short overview of what we kind of discussed today, and I hope you enjoy it. So one of the things, the well, one of the things, or if not the thing, I want you to remember from this presentation is the four Ds for decolonization. This includes discussion, diversity, decision making, and determination. All of these are integral to um, de um, decolonization work. And I want you to watch out for examples of these um, during my presentation. Um, so first of all, I just want to kind of inform you how how is science decolonized? Um, because I think it's one of those topics that we often um, don't know um, exists. And I think it's important um, that we understand and establish um, how is science um, colonized. So, um, sorry, hang on. Yeah, so, um, I'm more going to talk about modern day, um, how, how in the modern day um, science continues to be colonized. Um, but how, harking back to the past, so the scientific revolution kind of coincided with the expansion of European empires. Um, the information from the colonized world was often returned to imperial Western centers and disseminated into some of the subjects that we know today. Um, these imperial centers um, become the, have become the prominent centers of academic theory, scientific progress and intellectual authority. Um, however, this unequal appropriation of this, the knowledge oper um, uh, operates a social power dynamic that can lead to an unequal distribution of, um, of diversity and low representation, as well as marginalization of other knowledge systems in science. Our curriculum is a selective education system that delivers privilege. Um, and I think that um, higher education is very much connected with wealth, poverty, gender, sexuality, race divisions, and language all across the world. Um, it, there's particular problems when we also look at the knowledge depletion in the global south. Um, the impacts of colonialism um, can be seen where the, a lot of Western influence um, in the global south um, dictates the research in which they do. And um, the choice of topics often reflects um, the priorities of the global north um, rather than the global south. So common fitful, um, pitfalls include portraying other cultures and countries um, as places in need of saving from things such as disease, where Western scientists can often select um, the specific subjects of study rather than taking a collaborative approach to understand uh, the needs for all concerns. So, for example, um, with the research in malaria, the Zika, Ebola vi um, virus disease, and other emerging um, diseases, um, may they that have been proposed um, and funded, but without kind of collaboration from the local communities facing these threats. So, science often um, doesn't always fundamentally help those within the um, global south um, with the needs that they need. Um, they have um, in terms of their local needs. Um, and there's also, like has been said before, um, the, the, the colonized representation in our, in our books, the things that we educate our children with, the history education system, it's important to realize there's such a lack of representation that young people don't see um, role models. They don't see people they, um, that are like them. And that is a problem across race, gender, um, sexuality, disability, and all the different characteristics. So it's important to understand um, these these features. Um, and I think it's important to also allude to the fact that um, 
science has is one of the um the most well lucrative um aspects of education in terms of the research that it produced so it's very important who gets access to that um and often um people within the global south um and that can be people of color um are disadvantaged so um what is decolonizing science because i think often people don't actually know what it is um or what it means so it's kind of looking at it's a paradigm shift towards a more accepting and inclusive curriculum i think that um includes other philosophies and cultures and systems decolonization of chemistry um curriculum involves consideration of what we teach how we teach and why we feel we must teach in the way we have it's about this um, dismantling um, and de-eurocentralizing narratives that are dominant to science and creating a more inclusive curriculum, as I said. It's reforming staff and student diversity guidance, expanding higher education, science teaching, so looking at different methods of teaching, but I will discuss that later. Increasing visibility and um, being a proactive ally, as in offering mentorship, networking opportunities and mental health support. So why do we need to decolonize science? Um, so, like I said, it's for the role models. Um, we know how science has excluded people of cover, color. Every time a chemist analyzes the splitting patterns observed in an NMR spectrum, they are unknowingly applying the work of two 11th century mathematicians, Omar Kayam and J, um, Jia Exan. Or, um, or when we discuss aspirin, which has origins that date back to ancient Egypt um, and the use of the willow bark, um, there has not been much representation within science of um, people of colour's contribution. And this does affect um, how future generations grow up to understand science and if it is for them. Um, the active exclusion of people of colour is, is, is evident, um, but it's worth noting it's, um, and what is often missed out of the conversation, even though I know this is Black History Month, but being black doesn't mean you can also be obviously LGBT plus or disabled. There's an intersectionality there. Um, I'm an intersectional um, person. So I think it's often um, what's missed out of the decolonizing conversation is the fact that colonialism and, and science has really affected um, views on gender, biological sex and disability. And I think it's led to um, some harmful misgivings of um, the LGBT community, such as people of intersex and inclusion of those in, in um, scientific research and the disabled community. So I think it's important we address the fact we need to address all of issues of identity um, including race um, to decolonize our curriculums. Um, so it, it proposes a way in which we can expand our minds as a, as, a, as a collective, as a scientific community. It allows us to look at other diverse points of view. Um, it, it, looks, it looks at other systems, philosophies, and that can only help to expand our knowledge of the world and understanding, um, which can only be really a good thing. Um, and so, yeah, I think what, what I want to discuss now with you is kind of where we can begin, um, because suggestions have ranged from like nurturing a more inclusive um, and representative workspace. But just because you have a more a greater diversity of people doesn't mean you have more a greater diversity of thought or you have inclusion of those people. So it's creating environments where you do have that. Um, and or from course changes so um the idea that we can introduce science in uh, thematically so introducing different um things in different themes such as um instruments and the use of um the use of calculations um to bring together different scientific traditions from different backgrounds that could be that is a suggestion but i understand that despite this and despite the wealth of knowledge out there and knowing how to begin decolonizing science and the decolonizing science environment is quite difficult and it can be a daunting process um, and i see um a majority of you did vote for um a little confident or not so confident so i'm going to concentrate on those at um at the start so if you're not so confident, there's, I suggest there's three starting points. First, you can educate yourself. Start with something that's relatively easy, like, like I said, research, and read around what decolonized science is, and then relate it to your own experience. Understand it how you want to decolonize science for you personally, as well as the people around you. 
because it's important to do it to fit your environment. Um, and uh, I recommend um, these recommendations, um, sorry, I recommend these people and these um, texts because it's really important that um, you, you note who is um, the major um, pioneers within this um, decolonizing science movement. I think also start a conversation. It's really healthy and really important and, and a way of expanding us to, to talk about science, but also to talk about things that are pertaining to science but aren't our core science research. So start a conversation with your colleagues, students, staff, members, and also there's um, the chance to do surveys. So I'll just talk about one particular survey that was done um, at Kingston University. Um, this challenge, um, they have a, a above 80% um, BME um, percentage and the, the split was um, as seen here. Um, this is no means conclusive work, but it's just to show that how you can start um, surveying your, your student population. So what kind of the results showed was that a lot of um, students um, weren't to, um, when they wanted to, uh, how they proposed uh, staff should decolonize in science, um, a lot of them said, um, reflect on what is excluded and review teachers um, and teachings. Um, and if you are to look at how, um, who is looking for decolonizing science, I think um, it shows that more black students are, even though they are in a higher percentage, but um, yeah, more black students are looking um, at the um, decolonizing science because maybe they think it's more towards them. But I want to say here now that decolonizing science, again, is for everyone. It's, for, it's not pertaining to only people of color and it doesn't only serve people of color. So if you're a little bit confident, um, now's the time to start using your voice um, because it's important. Um, you have, if you are in a position of privilege, um, a lot more doors open and platforms that you can use. Um, so join a conversation. There's there's lots of um, decolonization conversations going on. Eventbrite is an international um, platform that you can look for decolonization talks and join and ask questions and that way learn more and also share this information share all the information you learn with your colleagues around you and then the second one if you're a little bit more confident is to um, host a workshop so I won't label this point too much here but what we um this is where I'm just going to describe the decolonizing science workshop so what we do we introduce um attendees like I have today to what decolonization, say, decolonization of science is um, and then we kind of explore examples of universities and indigenous cultures that have already done it so you're presented with people that have already started on their journey so you don't feel like you're starting from the foundations you're building on other people's work and then challenge um, we challenge individuals to think about their own courses and if you want to find out more information please visit the website um, that's down here but it's really important that this workshop builds up the confidence of people to decolonize science and there's many opportunities for you to start your own workshop or to to interact with ours um, and it's important that you do because it is a lot easier when you're doing it amongst your colleagues and people that know um, then when you're starting it all by yourself and you're not alone. So just to share all of that, if you are um, confident um, in your decolonizing science work, which I know 10% of you were, um, some suggestions that I have is um, providing opportunities to people of color or um, underrepresented groups, as well as um, low socioeconomic um, um, individuals um, to go to conferences where they talk and talk about science and not their identities. It's, it's important to create spaces where we can connect other um, on other things other than our identities. And in a progressive scientific space, this really allows um, people who are, don't commonly feel confident to be themselves in a group to be themselves. So I think this is, was an excellent way I attended. It was an excellent way of drawing together people who are, have similar, similar, not the same characteristics and allowing us to feel confident and um, comfortable within ourselves um, and to also talk about our amazing environmental science. So this is Polar Horizons and there's a link in that for that in my website. So you can see that later. Also, you can run networking opportunities. So these opportunities, we ran a Being Being Me in STEM event in 2019. And this really had a mix of cultures, backgrounds, people, and what they were tasked with was understanding what being in be, um, being me in STEM was like. And 
was it was it an issue was it contentious did it make us feel a particular way and what we found it it did but that conference didn't actually just do that it actually wanted to more concentrate on the positive solutions and i think that's what's important with decolonizing science you have to concentrate on the positive solutions to the effects of colonialism we understand that colonialism has happened and it's not to forget that but it's to build from that um, it's to understand that we are a community across the world and we can connect um, with, our, um, with each other. Um, also curriculum form. So I'm just going to quickly move on to this. So um, at the Kingston University also trialled um, using active learning techniques. So what they did was they, um, Neil um, Williams, uh, he put together an inorganic course with his students and they worked cohesively to design um, part of this course um, for themselves, like reflect themselves in it. And it's not to say that um, the attainment gap that was that was seen improving, so it was 14.3% to 10%, uh, to plus 10%. Um, it's not to say that is, um, uh the the this the change in this course is the reason however it is saying that there was the, the part of the many changes that were implemented this could be part of the reason that students felt like they did or did do well because they felt they had autonomy over their subjects they felt that they were included in their curriculum which is a powerful thing and should be done more um, and this is one of, I think, the last thing um, about um, being confident, I think, is also being a mentor. And being a mentor is is an interesting a role because you get to impart your knowledge. They can be international. Um, we often think that role models, we don't have enough in the UK, it, it, but we can expand our reach. We can connect with other universities across the world and provide them as a, a mentors to people. And that can actually allow better into um, international links for young undergraduates and young people in, in school. So I think it's important that we do that. And also um, running outreach um, activities such as Sci, um, Sci for Us, they run a outreach program with young people to inspire them into science and um, kind of break down science to them. And I think outreach and role models and mentoring is a really important way um, we can help the younger generation into STEM um, as well as their confidence and we sh it shouldn't be just a given that we all have imposter syndrome. We need to work on that. And part of that is reflection in the course as well as mentoring. So just to quickly um, discuss, I think I'm running on time. Um, so Creative Tuition. Um, so Creative Tuition is my um, charity, um, pending charity. So it's a company right now. Um, and what we're looking at is, is this, is the access into education. It's, it's understanding who is um, getting, private tuition and how that is allowing them, them to progress and giving it to people that may not have the same opportunities um, as these uh, the other people. So I think it's what um, we offer private tuition, um, workshops and learning activities and personal mental health development. Um, so this is just a small little plug, but yeah, if you would like um, to donate to the cause um, and read more about what we do, please visit my website. Um, but just to say, we also have a blog um, and this is um, what I'm alluding to. So we want to provide a platform for people of color from underrepresented groups, black, um, BAME, anyone that um, we feel that, like we know that um, needs to be represented and um, represented on the, on the international and national platform. We want to give them a corner to write about their experiences and their science as, as, as well as like informing young people. So um, we offer workshops and we offer, um, guidance and also consultancy as well so it's really important that we have these things to help our young people um, and guide them into um into higher education or other vocational jobs that are to do with stem um so to remember called decolonization work it can be done by anyone and that um it can be done internationally and nationally and their support networks everywhere um so now it's your turn um so I will we'll talk about this later as well, but um, while we're throughout doing questions, I want you to start thinking about um, how you can hashtag decolonizing STEM, um, decolonize STEM. So one of the things um, I will be putting is I plan to engage with the student body um, from marginalized groups to understand 
the access into chemistry and whether chem why chemistry isn't attractive to them um, to help guide my research into how to best help those people from those communities. So there's there's so many different things you can do. You can say you can say hashtag STEM, um, decolonize STEM, and um, just keep that as your as your pledge. Um, or you can write something that you want to do, like increase your mentoring or encourage mentoring. Um, but it's completely up to you. And um, yeah, it's your time to also get involved and um, to support the, the cause and movement towards a better education system. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Lara. That was there was a lot of information there in a, in a fairly short period. So just a reminder, there is a recording made available of this, so you'll be able to go back and watch that again. Or we have put out the link to Lara's website, so do have a look there. I've had quite a few questions about that as well, but it, what I'll do, I think, is uh, pass some of those over to Lara to respond uh, at a later time, as we are already starting to run out of time a bit. So one thing, let, let's see if we can bring everybody back on. So. Uh, Let's just see if we can get Robert's webcam up again as well, and hopefully we'll get uh, Karen's audio working. One thing that came up a lot in the registration form and a couple of times uh, throughout this, uh, I think there are a lot of people who want to be allies, they want to be supporting, and but at the same time they feel very uncomfortable with putting the work onto BME people by saying, what do I need to do? So I'm going to take that step for them. And I know I'm putting the work on you here, but what can I do as an ally or what can teachers do as allies and supporters to, to try and make the life of black people in chemistry better, to try and break down those barriers, open those doors? Um, well, I'm, I'm happy to go fast. Uh, I, thank you, Robert. Yes. Um, so I think um, I, I can understand that the, the, the people may be un, uh, uncomfortable or maybe simply because they don't know what to do. Yeah. Um, uh, but for those who are in a position to be able to um, enthuse others and uh, encourage others, uh, it's, 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 it's really to, um, first of all, it's, it's the expectations, particularly for younger, uh, younger people, expectations in terms of what they can achieve. Um, I think you, you, you need to be able to show uh, or to make them feel that uh, there is no limit to what they can achieve in any sense. So that, that, is, that is something that nobody's going to tell you what to do. That is something that you just simply have to, 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 to be able to, um, uh, to do. Uh, but, 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 but beyond that, um, just make sure that you are not um, making the, the environment unfriendly in any shape. Of just make sure that it's an environment that is friendly where uh, people can actually uh, thrive. So uh, not everybody is going to be in a position where they can, uh, in a very short period of time, see that they have been a sponsor to somebody and they've actually um, uh, guided somebody along that pathway. But it, 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 it is just actually uh, being able to create that environment uh, where everybody can succeed. You are part of that environment and it is very small things that uh, sometimes uh, people will will do, will suggest, will uh, that actually put people off. And it's actually thinking about what you're doing uh, in your environment uh, at all times, and not to, uh, to 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 do anything that you think is acceptable. Uh, if you think it is likely to be unacceptable, don't do it. But then, of course, there is a group of perhaps more senior individuals who should actively do that, who should give up their time, who should uh, perhaps go to um, talk to groups of young people, perhaps take on somebody who you can see uh, may, may in the way that you would do for any other person. And mm -hmm. the networking that actually has um, allowed many of our uh, careers to grow, some people don't have that network. And, and, and we just, let's just be aware that uh, everybody should be able to benefit from that, that net, networking and advice and pointing them to the next direction or who might be able to help them uh, so that they are not left out. Thank you very much, Robert. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Karen, any thoughts? Um, yeah, probably far too many for the few <laughs> moments we've got left. Um, but but I, I think I would echo uh, I think Robert's point and um, and I and, and I and actually just probably just take it back to some basics for for many. I mean, I think the one critical thing is to spend time reflecting on on your own mess, right? What's going on in your head? 
the ways that you might judge or think or, or presume about different sets of people. Um, uh, there's a lot of work I think we can do on an individual basis um, as we start to think about, you know, what are the ways we might be contributing to certain sets of, of patterns or environments or whatever it might be. But I think a really bigger win that we could have collectively. Um, and, and I think part of that is when do people boost others? When do they cede the floor to someone else? When, they, when do they use their sets of contact? To actually be able to allow somebody else to have that recognition and that and and the and the the chance to be able to talk and celebrate their work, there's some. I mean, taking taking everything that everyone has said on the panel, but I think there's some real clear things that people can do that can that can ultimately make sure that it's not about them if it's really going to be about other 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 um, chemists or other groups um, where they want to you know use their allyship and and giving up your own space and your own privilege for others is a powerful, very important way to ultimately do that. I guess in terms of just simple practicalities, if you're invited to give a presentation, but you know that, uh, that somebody else would be better at doing it, that's always a good opportunity to try and find the right person. Uh, from Chemistry World's perspective, I've got to be honest, we, we sometimes struggle to get enough diversity in our freelance stable or in people willing to make comments on news stories and so on. Uh, and that, again, I think reflects the fact that the, the network isn't, isn't always there and isn't always supportive. And so maybe sometimes we shouldn't take the easy option of the existing for want of a better phrase, old boys network will help us find somebody mm -hmm. in no time at all and we can get this story written and done. Sometimes we need to put a bit more effort in, I think, to, to break out of those older existing networks. Lara, do you have any thoughts to add? Um, can you just remind me of the question so I don't um, repeat anything of uh, what has been said? Essentially, what what can what can I do uh, to be a better ally, to be more of a support, mm -hmm. to help break down these barriers? I think I can echo what everyone has said. I think it's important that you um, stop asking the question, what can I do? Because right. I don't, I'm not a fountain of, well, okay, I've just presented the whole thing, but <laughs> in like acting or having people, like I only, I had to learn all of this by myself, for myself. I'm, I'm a, bear in mind, I'm, I'm still quite a young person and I've started, I'd started the decolonizing science initiative with a group of academics who are much um much a lot further along in their their journey and i i we all came together and started this um, event which was amazing but again like you're never too young or too of anything to start this you you just have to research the, the we live in an age of google like google is your friend it's my best friend when it comes to research um as well as um web science and all the different networks you can see research papers are there's loads there's actually almost no excuse now and i i mean this in a in a not harsh way but there's almost no excuse now to say i don't know where to start because there's enough literature out there to know where to start i think is also i think what m most people are saying when they say oh i don't what like what can we do is is saying like you tell me the way to 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 fix the problem that people who maybe of my industry has created we don't know how to fix that problem because we didn't create it um we just were born into it i think it's really important that we address our own privileges i'm still a privileged person even though i'm a pri and i'm a black person um and it, it, it's important to recognize where our privileges are and how we can start to use that like all the things I'm doing, the reason why I'm telling everyone is because I want to have a platform and use a platform to help young people. I want to guide them up. It's about not looking up. It's, it's guiding people who, who are of um, not a lower position, but is not as further along in their career and guiding them with you um, and creating that pipeline. We need to fix the pipeline um, by allowing us to all connect together in, in our journeys. And that's why we do these things i think karen and robert and i i think we do these things to to keep everyone informed but also to inform people that you have autonomy over over how you want your environment to look you have to demand different and better for it to get better um i just want to leave you with one quote um that um james baldwin said and it was on my presentation but he said that not everything that is faced can be changed but nothing can be changed until it is faced that's a lovely quote. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I tried to get across earlier. I think some people 
are uncomfortable with putting the work on to you and clearly they should be if there was a problem that i needed to solve here in my house then i would start by looking at google i would not immediately phone a builder to try and resolve that i wouldn't say well this you know tell me how to re resolve it and i'll sort it i'd do that legwork myself and clearly i have no excuse for not doing that legwork when it comes to making a more welcoming environment for all of my colleagues regardless of their ethnicity so thank you for thank you for the reminder and yeah i think sometimes people like me should feel uncomfortable in these conversations because i'm not necessarily doing the legwork that i should be so it's nice to have people like you uh, happy to uh, to put me over the coals on this when i ask a question that, that i should have thought about more in advance so thank you no, but um, also, like, that's why you've also brought me to this presentation because i've given you resources like all of all the things i've suggested today today have they're all a resource for you to use. So they're a springboard um, and I'll make this accessible to everyone on this conference call. Um, it, it's a springboard for all of you to do your own work. So it's not like we're leaving you in the dark and there's nowhere to go. We're providing you with the information and the resources. You're not starting from zero and we don't expect you to do everything, but it's just the autonomy to feel like you do it yourself. Um, but also, if you don't have access to resources, there are libraries, maybe not in COVID, but there are places and people you can talk to. Um, it's just about talking and discussion and then action. Yeah, excellent. Well, we have technically overrun, so we uh, we probably should bring things to a close. Um, I've got a few resources to share before we go, but I, I, I'm sorry we haven't had a great deal of time for questions. As I said, I'll pass these questions on to our speakers uh, who hopefully will be able to get back to you. Lara, there's some, some people who are clearly very interested in uh, the decolonizing science concept, so we'll certainly uh, pass their details on to you as well, but thank you very much. But I must say, it's been uh, it's been fantastic work. Somebody did ask us, I'm sorry, I know we're running late. Somebody did say, you know, are we just doing this event because it is Black History Month? Now, clearly, Black History Month is a good opportunity for people like Chemistry World to put on an event like this. It's a great hook for us to peg this event onto. And we have been doing a series about building a better chemistry culture anyway that this tangentially relates to. Um, but it is a good point. And you know, Black History Month, as Karen said earlier, that this isn't this isn't just about one month in which we think about the diversity of our colleagues and the people that we work with, but these hopefully will feed into some learnings that we can use for the rest of the year and the rest of our lives as well. So good question. Thank you. And thank you for challenging us on that. Um, so that I think is really all we have time for. Let's uh, first of all, uh, just a little reminder that we asked you to uh, to see, think about making a pledge. Uh, with the hashtag decolonized science do seriously think about doing that and if you are unwilling to do so then that in itself may be a little challenge a little question uh, for yourself to deal with um, the uh, resources that we did previously have on the screen uh, we will also send out in the follow-up email for this so uh, there's plenty of extra information there about things that you can get involved with and things that you can research. If you'd like to join us next month for the next webinar in, in this sort of vein, in fact, this is the next Building a Better Chemistry Culture webinar, uh, we're looking at uh, LGBT plus inclusivity. So we've already talked a little bit about intersectionality. Well, this uh, is looking specifically at LGBT individuals. Uh, we're looking at how to eradicate discrimination and exclusionary behavior, lots of parallels with what what we were talking about there about making an, a, a welcoming inclusion the uh, environment uh, we'll look at inequalities experienced uh, within the lgbt plus umbrella we'll look at building welcoming environments and we'll have a new toolkit of lgbt inclusivity resources for the chemistry community uh, lots of links going out to you there do grab those before the end of the webinar as well and i'd like you to keep an eye out uh, of the 2020 rsc inclusion and diversity forum which will take place virtually in december it does have a focus on race so it will cover some similar topics but hopefully uh, we'll develop some of those into a, a larger conversation being a diversity forum event there will be announcements about that soon uh, so thank you very much to uh, to everyone for organizing all of that and finally uh, thank you a huge thank you to our guest to karen salt to robert mccoyer and to lara lalemi thank you so much it's been uh, interesting it's been engaging it's been challenging it's sadly uh, nowhere near enough time but hopefully we'll be able to have you back for another similar event and uh, start making some more discussions in terms of how we can make chemistry the 
the, the chemistry world that a little bit more welcoming for everybody and we all benefit from a more diverse set of colleagues and friends thank you to rachel as well who's doing our interpretation she's had a very busy uh, hour and 10 minutes so i'm sure she'll be uh, welcoming of a break at the end of this uh, i'm ben valsler and chemistry world's digital editor and i'll see you again for another chemistry world webinar thanks again